from the Gospel of Matthew, the 14th chapter. This is a food miracle. Jesus fed 5,000 plus. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing this, the crowd followed him on foot uh, from the town. When Jesus landed and, and, and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowd away so that they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. And Jesus, is, Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. Do give them something to eat. We have only five loaves and two fish, they answered. Bring them to me. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up the twelve baskets of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was, were about 5,000 men, besides the women and the children. Frankly, it's kind of hard for us here in the West. get our minds around what a challenge food was in this day and age in Jesus' time. Food was expensive. It was difficult to come by. It was difficult to make grow in an in a arid desert region. And then on top of everything, it was time-consuming to prepare a person would work eight hours a day, maybe making a meal for the family. It was very challenging, very difficult. Again, and just to help us bring into focus just what a challenge food can be, I'm going to uh, want to look up a couple of things here that will help us to understand it in not so far back in history, but a little bit more recent. About 150 years ago, corresponding roughly with our Civil War, uh, there was a potato blight that swept Ireland. And people there were starving. Potatoes rotted in the field. Uh, somehow the, the uh, potato blight was swept into potatoes that were actually still in storage and affected those. And widespread famine broke out across Ireland. There was a time in which an Irishman would have killed me for what I got in my hand right now. Is that bad? Is that bad? And during this time, all of Ireland's society was completely redone. Uh, fashions were redone so you could hide food inside your clothing. Uh, there were times in which uh, just uh, awful kinds of uh, eating habits that came among people so they could eat what they got, eat what they had. And then not only that, but the Irish left Ireland by the hundreds of thousands, came here to America, and figured their chances of fighting our civil war were better than their chance were better than 
of starving to death in Ireland. And as a matter of fact, when Irish families would come to this, the United States in the 1860s, they would land up north in New York or places like that. The men would be constricted right into the Union Army when they set foot on our shore. They got a little signing bonus and they could buy food with that. It's hard to believe how it affected everybody in society. Just simply food. And you can imagine in Jesus' day, when food is a complete challenge, when food is scarce, it just affects everything and everybody when you go around somewhat hungry nearly all the time. This is the day and age in which Jesus did this food miracle. And I'll tell you something about us about this. I must have paid up here. This is going to be my lunch, by the way. Um, years ago, I gave this a message like this. I was down in Goshen. And um, I had I told about the Irish part of this story. And then I just had the potato up there with me, and I could say, you know, at lunch we may just eat one of these beautiful little things up, split it down the middle, put on butter, sour cream, a little salt, a little pepper, uh, maybe some broccoli or something like that, some cheese, and um, it'd be delicious. It'd drip with butter, you can just imagine it. Well, little did I know, well, I, I knew one thing about this. There was a Skyline Chili Parlor right down the street from the church down the street and about around the corner. And I was told, I didn't see it actually myself, I was told that after church, a solid string of cars was from the church parking lot to the Skyline Chili Parlor's parking lot. An entire string of cars. In fact, people in our, from our church were in that chili parlor for over an hour. Because they had big faith. Carol Burnett, many of you will remember her, a gifted, talented actress and comedian, was raised in poverty in Hollywood, California, of all places. Now, she was born in San Antonio, her parents were alcoholics. She told on a TV talk show one time that she was getting interviewed that um, she never learned to cook. Her grandmother didn't teach her to cook because food was so precious in their house and so hard to come by and so expensive that they could not waste any food teaching a child how to cook. They couldn't afford So people with food challenged in this day. Jesus was aware of the distress and genuinely desired to help. Jesus had compassion. And it wasn't just that these people were hungry right at this moment. <coughs> Frankly, in Jesus' day and age, they were hungry most of the time. But the scripture tells us, first of all, and it establishes a real hallmark for our Christian experience and faith, that Jesus had compassion. Jesus had compassion on these people. He knew their situation. He knew their difficulties. And he had compassion. And that is a hallmark of Christian faith and experience and understanding for all time. Jesus had compassion. And with a word or two from Jesus, the disciples pick up on it too. It's time to help. It's time to do something about this. The crowd needed to eat. They were hungry. Excuses would not do. Groceries were necessary. Jesus felt this was not a reason to leave. It's never a reason to leave Jesus. 
There is no reason to just walk off from what our Lord is doing and where our Lord is working and from what's going on. There was nothing about Jesus that would cause a person to want to go away. There were some loaves and some fishes. Four or five loaves and a couple of fish. I hope all those people like fish. I'm okay with it when there's no other choice. Jesus looked to heaven. Anytime we have a difficulty, anytime that we have a situation that's hard to handle, hard to understand, hard to get our minds around for whatever reason. Anytime we have a situation that is perplexing, it's time to look to heaven. And Jesus looked to heaven and gave thanks for what was on hand. That's always a good thing to do too. Thank God for what we have. The disciples helped pass it around. Jesus chose to use the hands of the disciples to do his work. And that's an assurance and a reassurance and a hope-building statement for all of us. Jesus chose to use his disciples. Jesus chose to use his church to reach people. Jesus has chosen to use us to reach out to people. <laughs> and always and everywhere, we need to have on our head, on our minds, and on our hearts. And we need to have it as a way of life. Reaching out. Being the hands of Jesus. Being the feet of Jesus. We need to bring Jesus to people. We need to bring compassion to people. We need to bring care to people. That's an exciting and a rewarding thing to do. And nowadays it is so necessary when people are struggling with isolation and people are struggling in many cases with uh, not enough income and having their work disrupted and having situations in which people that depend on them are getting disappointed and it's hard to face as a parent, as, as a breadwinner in the family, as anything else that, that is significant in the lives of people when you're not able to do what you ought to do and want to do and would like to do. But Jesus worked through who was on hand. He worked with what he had. They worked where they were at. Nobody had to go. And the disciples came through. They handed the food out. They got the people covered. The crowd men, women, and children um, were more like probably 20,000 people. There were 5,000 men. In this day and age, for whatever reason, they didn't count the women and children. And so only men were counted. So that's important for all of us to understand. This affected 20 thousand people. It started out with a feeling of compassion. It went until the disciples were drawn in and worked among the people and handed things out. This miracle, this food miracle, is one of the very few miracles contained in all four Gospels. That is important. All four Gospels. This story in one form or another. The Holy Spirit in the early church thought it was that important. Miracle of miracles, there were leftovers. Now that's something in an ancient day and in and, and our society to this day where people are food challenged. You just don't see leftovers. In our country, I have been told, and I never have seen it for sure, but I have been told that 40% of prepared food is thrown away. 40% of prepared food in this country is thrown away. That's hard to imagine. But these 
disciples and these people had probably never seen leftovers in their lives. They had probably never seen food go not eaten and be left over. And then there were 12 basket loads. 12 basket loads of food left over. And this started with compassion. What can we do to show compassion? Jesus can feed God's people. And he did. Jesus thanked God for what he had on his hand. And he set out to use it wisely. We can all trust in God's unlimited resources. We serve and we worship a God that has no limits. And again, that is hard for us to get our minds around because we think in terms of so easy of things running out, of things not being enough, of just playing um, supplies, just limited. But yet, with God, all things are possible. And supplies are unlimited. The things we need from God, the compassion, the love, the grace, the mercy, are all unlimited. Have no limits. Have no bounds. So we see this food that Jesus presented to these people as a mark of grace and a mark of compassion. It's unlimited. It's unlimited. There's a curious thing about this story and the way it ends. Very shortly after the crowd was fed, 5,000 people, 5,000 men, and the rest women and children had something to eat. And the 12 baskets were gathered up. And these aren't just little picnic baskets or little Easter baskets. These are pretty good sized woven baskets that would probably somewhat similar to the size of this pulpit here. All of, it, all of the scraps were gathered up. And Jesus left the area. Left the area at once because he was afraid that people were going to make him king. Make scripture for today is from Matthew 14 verses 13 through 21. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed, he saw a large crowd. He had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the village and buy themselves food. Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 baskets of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. This is the word of God for you, the people of God.
In understanding miracles, we must first understand that God, in his wisdom, established a certain set of laws and rules for the working of his creation, for the maintenance of the universe, for the life and death of mankind, and for germination, growth, and decay of the vegetable kingdom, and so on. These rules are what we know and call the laws of nature. Any interruption with the working of these rules or laws of nature on the part of man brings about confusion or disorder. If a man were able to mess with these rules and laws, destruction would follow. If, for some reason, that God, in his wisdom, sees that it's necessary to move from his fixed laws and rules, we would all see that as a miracle. In various parts of the Bible, we see instances where God saw that it was necessary to allow some deviations from these laws. They were part of his plan for the welfare and betterment of the human race. Many miracles are accounted for in the Old Testament. Those miracles were done through Aaron, Moses, Elijah, and Elisha. Many more took place in the New Testament through Jesus and some of the more favored apostles. Jesus had many reasons for doing the miracles he did. He did it to prove who he was. He did it to teach important rules. But here in Matthew 14, we read that he healed people because he had compassion on them. Jesus was and is and always will be filled with love and care for his people. When you are hurt and suffering, remember that Jesus is right there with you. In the miracles where Jesus is proving his identity, he did it to show people that he really was who he said he was. John 5.36 puts it this way. I have testimony weightier than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I am doing testify that the Father has sent me. The miracle of the fish is the one that he performed to prove to Peter and the others that he was indeed the Lamb of God. After Peter put the nets out one more time at the request of Jesus, his nets were filled. Luke 5, 8-11 shows what Peter's response was when he realized who Jesus really was. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell to Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So they pulled their boats, boat, boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Jesus was affirming to those he was choosing that he was the Lamb of God. These miracles were necessary to prove to a doubting world that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. And when he did this miracle in front of those disciples, he knew that his disciples had to fully believe and fully trust in him without any doubt to be able to follow him through this ministry. Jesus knew what was ahead. Jesus did other miracles to teach important truths, such as in Matthew 8, 5 through 13. And in my section, in the section of my study Bible, it's entitled, The Faith of the Centurion. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home, paralyzed, suffering terribly. And Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not, have, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servants, 
do this, and they do it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of this kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness while there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And as his servant was healed at that very moment. In this scripture, Jesus is teaching his disciples and those who were around him that God's kingdom is meant for everyone, not just for the Jews. Even though the Jews were God's chosen people, Many did not have the faith that this centurion had. Jesus' message of salvation is for everyone. Each one of us has to make the choice to accept or reject the gospel. And no one can become a part of God's kingdom on the basis of heritage or connections. Just because you know a guy who knows a guy that's a Christian does not mean that you're going to get into heaven. You must believe and follow Christ. This centurion felt unworthy to even have Jesus in his house. He understood totally the concept of leadership and orders that would be followed when given by a leader. He was a centurion. He was over 100 soldiers. When he told them to do something, he knew they were going to do it. He had such faith and belief in Jesus as the leader he was that he knew if Jesus just said the word that his servant would be healed. And the servant was healed at that very hour. In today's scripture, Jesus has compassion on a people who had gathered to listen to his teaching. Just before these verses in Matthew 14, Jesus hears that his cousin, John the Baptist, has been murdered. He had just heard about this death. He was grieving, and he just wanted to be off on his own. But he saw the crowd. He put their needs over his own. He could have ordered them away, but he saw them, what they needed, and had compassion on them. This quote from the Clergy Coaching Network fits perfectly with today's part of the scripture. One of your greatest strengths is your willingness to be a blessing to others, even as you are experiencing your own storm. These people were hungry, and there were a bunch of them. The disciples were ready to send the crowd away into the villages to find something to eat. But Jesus told them, feed the crowd. The disciples were quick to tell Jesus, we don't have much. We have two fish and five loaves, and that's not going to go very far in a crowd of 5,000. Jesus asked the people to sit down, and as he took those two fish and five loaves, he blessed it and fed them all, including the women and children. Those two fish and five loaves of bread in the hands of Jesus were more than enough. He even had some left over for a snack later. Isn't that just like our Savior? To give the people even more than they needed. When Jesus calls on us, he has a plan for us, a goal for us. All we need to do is to bring the fish and the loaves, and he will do the rest. When Jesus saw the need of so many people, in this case, he felt compassion on them. He not only saw their hunger for what he was teaching, but for the physical hunger of their bodies. Eventually, Jesus would not only feed those searching for truth, he would give all he had for their salvation. He gave his life for each of us, that we may have eternal life. Before he died on that cross, Jesus would have one last meal with his disciples. 
which we have come to know as the sacrament of Holy Communion. Today's scripture is from Jeremiah 1 through 4, 1, 4 through 19. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. The word of the Lord came to me, What do you see, Jeremiah? I see the branch of an almond tree, I replied. The Lord said to me, You have seen correctly, for I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. The word of the Lord came to me again, What do you see? I see a pot that is boiling, I answered. It is tilting towards us from the north. The Lord said to me, From the north disaster will be poured on all who live in the land. I am about to summon all the peoples of the northern kingdoms, declared the Lord. Their kings will come and set up their thrones in the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem. They will come against all the earth surrounding walls and against all the towns of Judea. I will pronounce my judgments on my people because of their wickedness in forsaking me burning incense to other gods, and worshiping what their hands have made. Get yourself ready. Stand up and say to them, Whatever I command you, do not be terrified by them, or I will terrify you before them. Today I have made you a fortified city, an iron pillar, and a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judea, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but will not overcome you, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. So there you are in life, minding your own business, doing your own thing. You are trying to do what is right. You are trying to make a good living. You're trying to be godly. You're trying to follow the scripture that you read in the Bible. To be a good person. To love. You're trying to do all these things. You're trying to follow his law. But people around you are not following the word of God. They're not interested in loving one another. They're not interested in scripture in fact, if you bring scripture up to them, they will probably ridicule you, make fun of you. They could care less about the word of God. You don't like it? But really, what are you going to do about it? It's their life. It's their choice. They have free will, after all. And after all, you, you don't need the headache. You've got a million problems of your own. So, let them be. Let them be. You have enough problems. But then all of a sudden, out of the clear blue, God speaks to you. And God says, I've got a job for you. Those people down there that you are ignoring, those people that aren't following my law, those people that are loving one another, I need you to go tell them they are wrong. I need you to witness to them. And I'll be with you. Won't be easy. Bad things are going to happen. But I'll be with you. I'll 
give you the words, and I will rescue you. Well, let's be honest. Nobody likes delivering bad news. Nobody does. A, a doctor or a nurse, they don't enjoy telling a patient, going into the room and saying, well, it doesn't look good today. They don't enjoy that. A teacher doesn't enjoy telling a student, well, you tried, you studied hard, but you still got that out. I'm sure supervisors don't like telling employees, well, you know, times are not going well. So, we're going to have to lay you off. Or, it's time for promotion, but we're not ready for you yet. I'm going to give it to that, that person down the hallway. Supervisors don't like doing that. At least I hope they don't. But these things happen. Especially when we're in the time that we're in, with this disease going around. There's a lot of stress, there's a lot of bad news being told. Sue and I know someone who is in charge of a very large corporation. And this person took a pay cut, but still some had to be laid off, and others had to take pay cuts. And this person is getting death threats. Nobody wants that kind of ridicule. Nobody wants to be threatened like that. We fear being rejected. We fear being despised. We say don't shoot the messenger, but we know when we deliver that bad news, we've got a target on our back. But sometimes the job needs to be done. Sometimes bad news must be delivered. You know, sometimes that bad news is a good thing. Sometimes people need to hear that bad news to be inspired to do something about it. Now Israel is sinning. When we look at the scripture, that's made perfectly clear. Israel is sinning. They're, they're turning their backs on God. They're worshiping idols. They're not being faithful in their relationships. They're sacrificing people, human sacrifices to these idols, including their own children in some cases. They have turned their backs on God. All they're interested in doing is pleasing themselves and pleasing these false dead idols. And God is calling Jeremiah. God is calling Jeremiah to tell Israel to repent. Repent or a powerful force from the north is coming. King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon will defeat you and take you to a land that you don't want to go. It will take you from the promised land, that promised land that God brought you to your ancestors to many, many, many years ago after the exodus of Egypt. Now telling this news did not make Jeremiah a popular man. But God knew Jeremiah was the right person for the job. He tells Jeremiah when we look at the scripture, he formed him in the womb and knew him before he was born. God set him apart in his appointing Jeremiah as a prophet to the nations. God knows us. He knew all of us before we were born. He knows our strengths. He knows our weaknesses. Those who are good at making things, those who are good at creating things, you know what you're making. You know what you're creating. You know what you make. You know what the strength of it is. You know what the weakness of it is. You know these things. Jeremiah doubted himself. The way you can say that 
that he, he doubted the decision of God. He offered up this excuse of being too young, not a good speaker. If you recall, a long time before that, at the beginning of the Bible, God called this man named Moses. Moses offered up a similar excuse. Well, I don't really speak that well. Jeremiah should know this. God took care of that problem, and for Moses, things to have worked out pretty well if you read that scripture. God told Jeremiah to not be afraid, for he is with him. God put the words in the mouth of Jeremiah. We doubt ourselves when God calls. We have questions. We ask questions. We almost act like we wonder, does God know what he's doing by calling me? But if God calls, have faith. He will give you the tools to take care of the job he is sending you to do. <laughs> do not be afraid. Do not hesitate. Do not be shy. When God calls, he is with us leading us down the right path. And while we are on the path, God will continue to watch to make sure his desires, his words, are fulfilled. So in verse 11, God asks Jeremiah, what do you see? And he sees a branch of an almond tree. God sees that Jeremiah is faithful. He knows that many of the people will not turn from their wicked ways. He sees that he will have to carry out on his promise of punishment. And the punishment of Israel is coming. Now the almond tree is one of the first to bloom in the spring. It's early. Is coming. God asks a second time, what do you see? Jeremiah says, I see a pot that is boiling over. It is pulling towards us from the north. That line is to the north. And they will come. And God is watching. Now while Jeremiah is doing the work that God sent him to do, not everything was easy, and we see that in Scripture. He was ignored, he was beaten, he was ridiculed. He made a lot of people uncomfortable in that. He was put in jail for a while. But God never left Jeremiah. Jeremiah stayed faithful to God, and God would rescue him. Now, he didn't keep them out of trouble. He was right in the middle of it. If you look at verse 8, it says, not keep them from trouble, but rescue. Or sometimes this work is going to get unpleasant. Sometimes this work is going to not be fun. You'll be in the middle of it. But God will rescue. When Babylon did come, they treated Jeremiah with respect. But for other leaders of Israel, other noblemen, not so much. Israel was conquered, and many forced back to Babylon or killed. Only the poor stayed behind. Babylon, let the poor stay behind. And this was a, a military tactic. See, they knew that that poor wouldn't be strong enough to attack back. But they took the rich. They took the powerful. They killed them. Or they brought them back to their city. Now, an interesting part of the 
Scripture as where God appoints Jeremiah over nations. That's an interesting way of putting it. Over nations. Not just over Israel. Over nations. That includes Babylon. That includes us. His work, his message is meant for everyone, just not Israel. It's for us. After all, God made us. He knows us. We are meant to read this and be inspired by it, to learn from it. Now God told Jeremiah something else, something we didn't read in today's scripture. He told Jeremiah he would restore Israel. This exile and punishment for Israel would last 70 years. In the history of the world, not a really long time. Now in the history of individual, 70 years, of course, a long time. But not in the world. God would restore Israel. And he would make a brand new covenant with Israel. And that covenant involved the Messiah who would bring them back together. The Messiah was coming. God was angry. But God does forgive. God does restore. He creates, created us and he makes us new. He loves and restores. He wants the best for his creation because he loves us. God values us. So hear the good news. God made us and he knows us. Listen when he calls. Regardless of how hard you think it might be. Do it. For God will be with you. He values you. He will be there with us. Us. His creation. His love. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, help us to hear when you call. There are times, O oh Lord, there are days that you may not call us for anything in particular, nothing special. On those days, Help us just to love, to love you, to love one another, and then be ready when you call us for something specific. For we know at times, O oh Lord, people won't want to hear the good news because it interrupts their life. It hurts their choices. But give us the strength, O oh Lord, to still share that good news. So that others will know of your grace. 